help me welcome David Cole. All right. Oh, I think I hear it now. Well, thank you all for having me here. I hope you're having a good time. When, uh, when I signed up for this, they did not tell me that I was following the Attorney General. So um, <laughs> that's a little intimidating, but uh, Sam's a good friend of our firm. Um, I was at a seminar actually a couple weeks ago where he was talking about the health care law. As indicated in the, in the introduction, I, I do a lot of the health care law. It's because I think, frankly, because I'm one of the younger partners at my firm and I got tagged with doing the type of work no one else wanted to do at the firm, so I'm probably one of the few people next to Sam who's actually read the entire healthcare statute. I put it on my Kindle and over the course of a couple months read it slowly as I went to sleep each night. But uh, that's been an interesting process to go through um, and a lot of questions there. So I don't know if we're going to touch too much on that during this presentation, but uh, what my goal is in the, the relatively short time that we have is to give you a very broad overview of employment practices and policies. And, and the focus that I want you to walk away with is an understanding of uh, where, where employment law stands now. Where, what are the hot issues? What are the most likely areas of litigation where your county is likely to get sued or have a charge filed against it for employment related practices? We'll talk about what the hot areas are. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how these cases play out in the court system. When you go to trial, uh, if you're filing motions with the court, if you're defending them before the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, I think it's helpful to discuss how these cases play out in litigation. Because when you understand how they play out in litigation, it helps you understand how you should be managing your employment practices from the start. Because if you can correct these problems to begin with or put yourself in the best position knowing that you're likely going to get sued or have a charge filed against you, you're going to be one step ahead of the game. So we're going to talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about some recent developments in employment law on what I see as uh, maybe hot button issues for 2013. So with that, I hope that you walk away with, with a better understanding that, that might help you make good decisions as you, you go about your jobs. Uh, I've said that I thought it would be interesting to try and take questions throughout the presentation. Um, and I'll certainly try and take some at the end as well, but I think it works that if you have a question and we're on a slide, you want to raise your hand, um, let's give it a shot. Go ahead and raise your hand. Someone will bring a mic around and we'll, we'll try to address it right then. Just uh, be mindful that we've, we've only got an hour or so, and so be judicious with your questions and, and I'll be judicious with my, with my time as well. So. Um, so the agenda, like I said, we're going to talk about the current landscape of litigation. I want to let, let you know about basic laws that I think you need to know about in order to, to, to do your jobs. Some special issues affecting public employers. Obviously, uh, our firm does a lot of local uh, city and county representation, but we also do a lot of private business representation. Well, there's a lot of special issues that affect government employers that don't affect private employers. Um, and so a lot of you uh, have backgrounds, I'm sure, in the private sector, and I want to make sure you're aware of what the differences are uh, now that you're dealing with county employees. Understanding how discrimination is proven. That's what I'm talking about when I said that we're going to discuss how these cases play out in litigation. And then recent trends in employment law. So current landscape of employment litigation. I've put some statistics together that I thought would be interesting for you to see. Before anybody can actually file a lawsuit alleging employment discrimination, they first have to actually go and file what's called a charge of discrimination with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That is a federal agency that is designed to investigate and enforce federal employment laws. And what the process is set up to do is to basically act as a gatekeeper on the court system. You can see from these statistics that there were almost 100,000 charges of discrimination filed with the EEOC last year. You can only imagine what that would do to the court system if all of those were lawsuits. So instead, before you can go to court, you have to go to the EEOC and you there file a charge and then it is investigated by the EEOC. And the EEOC will 
uh, assign an investigator, they'll contact the county, ask you to submit a written response, various documentation such as your employee handbook and the employee's personnel file, and a written explanation of why you took the employment action that they're complaining about, which is usually a termination. Uh, then sometimes they will come out and conduct on-site interviews. They'll interview the managers or other employees and things like that. And, um, and conduct investigation to ultimately reach a decision about whether or not it believes discrimination occurred. Now, you hope that they decide that discrimination didn't occur and you get a great decision and that's a good victory. But regardless of what the EEOC decides, it will then issue the employee what's called a right to sue letter, which is sort of their golden ticket to go to the courthouse and then file a lawsuit. And all that is is a, is a proof that I, I've done my, my due diligence, I went to the EEOC, and now I'm entitled to file a lawsuit. But the idea is that if the EEOC doesn't find support for their claim, then that will maybe deter employees from pursuing that claim in court, uh, or, or possibly a lawyer from representing them. That's the idea. It acts as a filter, and it also is designed to help employers and employees resolve disputes early before they get into litigation. So when an EEOC is, uh, charge is filed, frequently you'll get notice that we have a free mediation program. And if you're interested, we invite the employer and the employee to get together and try to talk out the dispute and see if there's some resolution that can be reached. And I'll say, the EEOC is very effective at reaching those resolutions. And I think that if you're confronted with the charge, that's something to consider, um, not, not just dismiss out of hand. But what these statistics show, uh, this is about the past 10 years, obviously there's been quite, uh, quite an increase. We've, in 2000, there were only 79,000 charges. Now we're about to push up over 100,000, and we'll certainly clear that threshold this year. So uh, employment litigation is, is rising which is good, good business for, uh, for, for a lawyer in my field, but uh, not always good business for businesses to be in. Um, but the one point I thought would also be interesting is that the EEOC issues statistics about what types of charges are filed. So of those 100,000 charges that were filed last year, what were the claims alleged? And what this shows is very interesting because you'll see that retaliation is the most common allegation made. And that is the first time that has ever happened. Retaliation now outpaces race discrimination and sex discrimination as the most common claim there is in employment litigation. And what is retaliation? Retaliation is where an employee makes a complaint that they feel they've been discriminated against or that they feel they've been harassed or maybe that they think someone else has been discriminated against or harassed. And as a result of them making that complaint, they were retaliated against by either being transferred or demoted or fired or even minor things, given the cold shoulder, treated differently, not invited to the birthday party in the kitchen, little things like this, they all constitute retaliation in some way or another. And oftentimes, in fact, probably more, more often than not, we get a traditional discrimination claim filed that is coupled with the retaliation claim because oftentimes the employee uh, will get transferred to a different job. You know, but sometimes, say you're dealing with an employee who works in the sheriff's department and they get, they get transferred out of operations and, and into the jail division. Well, you know, people don't tend to like to work in the jail division. So they file a, uh, an EEOC charge alleging discrimination and then something else happens after that. They get their pay cut or they get suspended for something you know, typically unrelated, but they say, well, gosh, the timing of it is I get transferred, I complain about it at the EEOC, then my, my pay got cut. And so now that pay cut becomes a retaliation claim for them having filed an EEOC charge. So you need to be on alert when, when that occurs. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of reasons why retaliation has has increased the way it has. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the truth of the matter is, I think that employers and, and managers have, have gotten better over time with knowing that you're not allowed to discriminate. And, and obviously it still exists, but I think, I think employment practices have improved in that regard. But retaliation is almost human nature, I think. Because, frankly, if someone at my office accused me of sexual harassment and I was innocent, I would be mad about it. And I might start 
uh, wanting to avoid that person or giving them less work or, or avoiding him around the office. And just because of that, I've potentially walked myself into a retaliation claim if what I'm doing somehow impairs her ability to do her job. And, and, and that, I don't think that makes me a bad guy. I think that's just human nature, but that's, that's, that's why I think we're seeing the, the increase in claims. So something to be very aware of. The other big ones are, are, are still race discrimination, gender discrimination, uh, disability discrimination are all, all the, the big ones. You can see uh, the, the national origin, religion, um, color, those are, are smaller components of, of the types of charges that are filed. GINA, that stands for the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It is a new statute uh, recently enacted about a year or two ago that prohibits discrimination based on genetic information, which is uh, a variety of things, but basically it means uh, being predisposed to certain types of medical conditions or have, having family history of illnesses usually based out of some sort of fear that hiring that person would make your insurance premiums go up, uh, that sort of thing. So it's obviously a very, very small part of the discrimination framework these days, but it's out there, something to be aware of. All right, now when you talk about the grounds that people are alleging for discrimination, the next issue is, well, what are the actions that someone is suing about? There's a variety of things someone can sue about, but when you get down to it, it is all about the firings. In other words, someone can file a charge because they didn't get hired, or they didn't get a promotion, or because they got suspended, or a variety of things. But what the statistics clearly show, that 80% of the time, the charges are when someone loses their job. And they've done surveys and statistics, and a lot of people report that being fired from their job or being laid off from their job is one of the most traumatic experiences that they've had in their lifetime, uh, even outranking the death of, of family members for a lot of people. Um, so you can see that when you are dealing with terminations, that is what, what tends to lead to the to charges. And then the charges are broken down on those categories we discussed before. So I think the point to take away from this is just knowing where the risks are. The risks are clearly in terminations above all else, and the risks are primarily in retaliation, race discrimination, gender discrimination areas. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to kind of focus on what those are and how you can best protect yourself against those type of claims. Now, to talk about laws that, that govern the employment relationship, one of the first questions I always get from employers when they're faced with the uh, employment issue is, I thought Georgia was an at-will state. Well, yes, that's true, but let's talk about that a little bit. What is the at-will rule? The at-will rule says that all employment in Georgia is at-will, which means it can be terminated at any time by any party for any reason or no reason at all. That's the general rule. And a lot of people think that that is a license to fire people for whatever reason they want. And the answer is not so fast. Because yes, the rule is you can fire anyone for any reason or no reason at all, dot, 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 as long as it's not a discriminatory reason or a retaliatory reason, or one of the many, many reasons that have been prohibited by law. And so basically, state and federal laws and public policy exceptions have eroded, or perhaps eviscerated the employment uh, at will rule, so that it's, it's really not as powerful of a tool as you might think it is. But it's still an important tool, and it is still something that's important to preserve. So one thing that you need to be aware of um, is how to avoid being taken out of the employment at, rule, employment at will rule. Uh, someone will be employed at will unless you create some sort of contract that guarantees them employment for a specific period of time. All right? So that means every, if you make statements that you're going to be employed for, for the next year, or if your handbook says you're only going to be terminated for cause, or if an employee is covered by a civil service system that your county has, they are not going to be at will because you've guaranteed them uh, employment for a period of time. 
If you want to avoid that, then your handbook policies, your job descriptions, your offer letters, any sort of written policies, communications with an employee connected with the job offer should clearly state that this does not create a contract of employment, that all employment with the county is at will and terminable at any time. You should always have that sort of at will disclaimer if you want to avoid the at will rule. But even if you have the at will rule, even if an employee is at will, there are a variety of exceptions. For example, you can't fire an employee for refusing to commit an unlawful act, such as lying to an investigator or destroying documents. You can't fire someone for performing a, sur uh, a legal obligation like testifying at trial, serving as a juror. You can't fire someone for exercising a right, such as going to the EEOC and filing a charge or filing a workers' comp claim. These are what are called public policy exceptions to the employment at will rule. Um, a contract implied in fact. What does that mean? That means even if you don't have a written contract where you sign on the dotted line and you say you'll be employed for two years, you can still have a contract of employment because of things you say. If you do a good job, you'll never be fired. Or as long as I'm here, you're going to have a job. You have made an oral promise to that employee that courts in some cases have held can stand up as an employment contract. You've, you've guaranteed them uh, a term of employment. Um, handbooks and policy manuals sometimes can create if they, uh, a contract of employment. If they say you'll only be terminated for cause, or if they say your salary for the first year will be $50,000. Well, that some people would argue You've just said, for my first year, that guaranteed me a year of employment. So be aware of statements, and that's why I was recommending that any sort of written communication you have should have an at-will disclaimer in it. <clears throat> Another at-will exception, civil service systems. Yeah, question. On, on the, in the case of uh, oral promises, in, in the case of oral promises, what if you're not authorized to make a contract like that? Is it still in... in is it still a problem? Uh, potentially, yes, it's still a problem if the employee could have reasonably relied on the representation you made and, uh, and as if it appeared to that employee as if you had such authority and they relied on it and they relied on it to their detriment in some way, such as turning down another job offer. Uh, it can still be a problem, but, but you're, that's a good thinking. That is certainly a defense that's going to be raised. And, and the problem is these areas, there's, there's never a bright line yes or no answer rule. It it's always comes down to you know, lawyers arguing about the <laughs> different facts. Um, but that's, that's the argument they would make. We would make you weren't authorized to make an offer. They would argue I was reasonably relied on the apparent authority this person had. Um, all right, another exception are your civil service systems. Why is this an exception? Because most civil service systems say employees will not be fired except for cause. And then the statutes or the local legislation define what cause means, which usually is defined as gross misconduct uh, or you know, a, a poor job performance or a variety of things. So you can fire them for those reasons, but then you usually have to jump through some hoops to, to do that. You have to prove that they, they were being terminated for cause and then you usually have to provide that employee with a hearing that provides them with a notice and opportunity to be heard. And the, the civil service systems are set up various ways. Some counties have civil service boards comprised of, of local community members who sit on the board and hear these hearings. Uh, other, other places have county, their, their board of commissioners decide these things. So it's all, it's all a little bit different, but basically it's giving the employee an opportunity to respond and dispute the charges that have been made. All right. What else are, what other things are exceptions to the at-will rule? Well, all of the federal employment discrimination laws. And I thought, um, you know, each one of these, we, I've done seminars, standalone seminars on, on each one of these. Um, and so, obviously, it's too much to cover now, but I want to give you a broad overview. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. It was enacted in 1964. This was the, the original anti-discrimination statute. It prohibits employees from being discriminated against uh, in the terms and conditions of their employment for uh, their race, their color, their religion, their sex, and their national origin. You cannot discriminate against employees for those reasons. 
It also contains, like we've talked about, a retaliation provision that says you cannot retaliate an employee for complaining about, reporting, or participating in any sort of proceeding that is investigating or, or complaining about that sort of discrimination. Um, so that, that is the, the most common statute that these fall under. Yes? I, I want to go ahead and get this out now. Um, in this age of downsizing and job elimination, are those, as you're talking through this, when we eliminate positions altogether, does that fall under the same criteria? Yes, it does. Um, what we face in, the, in this era of, of layoffs is we justify a termination based on a, a job elimination or a reduction in force. But inevitably, someone's having to decide which positions to eliminate or which are the 10% of employees they're going to they're cut to reduce the workforce. And the employees that get selected are then filing claims saying, well, I agree, you know, there was a budget crisis, we had to eliminate positions, but the bottom line is I was selected because of my race or because I'm a woman or whatever the case might be. And then they're going to say, and, and my evidence of this is they retained Bob over there. And I was a much better employee than Bob, but they kept him. He's a white male. They, they chose me for reduction, uh, and I'm a, I'm a black female. And they, they allege discrimination. So uh, the answer is yes, you, you're still subject to discrimination claims, even in job elimination, reduction, and force. It just shifts the issue to why did you select that person for reduction, as opposed to you know, why did you fire that person for some sort of performance or misconduct reason. Another question. From, from Lincoln County. We have, a, like a lot of counties, new sheriff. His plan is to terminate the whole staff and rehire the ones he wants to keep on. How does that work with us with unemployment or benefits? Yeah, well, okay, so... <laughs> um, sheriffs, sheriffs, like district attorneys, like solicitors general, are elected county officials. Their employees are paid for by county funds, but they fall under the jurisdiction of the sheriff. There is case law uh, from the Supreme Court that says that sheriff's deputies are subject to political patronage dismissals because loyalty to the sheriff and the policies and, uh, and, and agenda that he or she ran on and was elected on, uh, loyalty to those things are an important part of the job. And because of that, uh, sheriffs can come in and virtually you know, eliminate their command staff and the sheriff's deputies. They do not have that same authority for non-sheriff's deputies, for investigators, clerks, secretaries, other sorts of people, because the cases have said that, that uh, loyalty in those type of positions the sheriff is not as important as it is for the command staff and the sheriff's deputies. But the bottom line is, yeah, look, if employee is, is laid off or fired, Regardless of the reason, they're going to have a right to go to the unemployment office and file for unemployment, and um, and 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 think in that situation they're they're going to get unemployment. I'll tell you that much. The Department of Labor is is very friendly these days with with giving away unemployment benefits, and and really unless you can prove that the person violated some work rule that you warned them about and it was in writing and they flagrantly did it anyways. They're, they're going give to them, give them unemployment, and I think just for being fired or laid off for, for being on the wrong side of, of politics, they're, they're going to get their unemployment. So it, it kind of stinks for you, but, but it, it is allowed. Question again. Billy Zorn, Irving County. In reference to the man asked a question about that we are decreasing the number of employees or whatever you want to call it because of the recession. Who determines the criteria on how it an employee is selected to be dismissed or cut out. Who, who, who makes that? Do, does the policy makers of the company or we as county commissioners? I want. I'm, I'm ignorant on that part. I'm sorry. No, that's that's fine. Well, there's there's not a, a one size fits all answer to that. To be honest, uh, counties do it a variety of different ways, and it depends on who has ultimate authority for for personnel decisions in your county. Sometimes that, that, that's the county commissioners. More often than not, that's with your, your county manager or county administrator. And then he or she can even delegate that authority to uh, you know, the department heads. So 
it can be any way you want, essentially, as long as it fits within the, 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 the local legislation you have for who is responsible for personnel decisions. But what you should do is make sure that you have uh, a procedure in place that's in writing as to what the criteria are going to be. And if you're going to delegate it down to department heads to make some decisions, what they should do is make recommendations and that should be reviewed up the chain of command to make sure that the decisions they have made uh, are consistent with the criteria that have been set out. So I, I think it is always best to, to make the criteria develop sort of a group process that I think you should be involved with, at least if not approving, that at least uh, familiar and have input into, and then probably the county manager and county or county administrator be ultimately responsible for, for implementation. Another question. Uh, Kevin Coker from uh, Baker County, uh, when you do the litigation going all the way to the, with the EOE, EEOC, yeah. uh, who's responsible for the litigation cost uh, even if the person loses? They're not responsible for your cost, are they? No. You, you hope ACCG is responsible for the litigation costs, right? I wish they, I wish they were, but we uh, <laughs> had a case on the school board on age discrimination. It was totally undone, but they all went with this and went to town and yeah. We're forced at paying two hundred fifty thousand dollars to fight it, and we could win it. Yeah. We settled for seventy-five, because that's what the insurance company wanted to do. But the taxpayers were still out of seventy-five thousand dollars. Something's wrong with that picture. Yeah. They screwed up. I, I, I hear you. It's a frustration that, that I um, I have to walk walk through our clients with all the time, which is just the American system is set up that uh, really. Um, the, the, the employee is, is not going to be responsible for your legal fees even if you win. And that's just, that's just the, the harsh reality and it stinks, but it is, it's the way it is. And, and sure, there, there are technically rules out there that if a, a claim so lacks merit and was grounded in bad faith that there's, there's a possibility that, that you can file a, a counter lawsuit and get your, your fees back, that, that never happens. I, I'll just, I'm, obviously I'm not, the, I, I'm still a younger lawyer, I'll say that, but I have never seen it happen. And, and so the, the courts are loath to do it because they're afraid that if they start making plaintiffs pay for their, the attorney's fees the other side if they lose, then it's going to deter people away from, from uh, you know, challenging their rights, and they don't want to do that. So uh, that's just an you know, unfortunate part of the system. But uh, if your, your county... Uh, should hopefully have insurance either through through ACCG or th otherwise make sure you have uh, what's called EPLI employment practices liability insurance because that is what protects against these type of claims um, all right moving along out of title 7 the age discrimination and employment act that prohibits discriminating against individuals because of their age and that applies to employees who are 40 years old or more so that's who it applies to, be aware of that. Typically these sort of claims are associated with acts in the workplace, inevitably, inevitably, it's where some comment was made to the employee about them not being good with computers. That I, 99% of the time, it's, it's, well, we're moving to a paperless office system, Steve, and we just don't think you're gonna be able to keep up with the technology. Well, gosh, you know. <laughs> That person usually interprets that as, I'm too old for the job. Uh, and maybe that's exactly what you meant. So um, that's what we see a lot there. The Americans, uh, one other thing I'll say about this, if you are engaging in a reduction in force, uh, and a lot of times when you do that, you offer employees release agreements to, to they will continue paying your salary for another month or two or three months if you'll sign this release agreement. If you're doing that to someone who's over 40, there are very special requirements about what you have to provide in that release in order for it to be effective. You have to provide a list of all the other people who are selected um, for, for termination and who are not selected so that basically the person gets a list and they can look at the ages of everyone selected and not selected to see if something funny was going on. So just be aware of that uh, as an issue. Hopefully your county attorneys will, will guide you through that correctly. The Americans with Disabilities Act protects people who are, who are disabled. This was recently expanded about two years ago uh, to include a lot more people as being disabled. There were a series of Supreme Court decisions over the years that had narrowed down the definition of who was quote unquote disabled under the statute. 
and Congress responded and said, we think it's become too narrow, we want to open it back up. So, for example, the Supreme Court cases had said, if someone has, let's say, uh, epilepsy, and they take medication to control their seizures, well, you decide whether or not that person is disabled based on how they are in their medicated state. So if, if they take medication, they don't have seizures, they're not disabled. And so that really was a big defense that employers could raise to discrimi uh, discrimination claims. Well, Congress took that away uh, and, and, and reopened it up, so now you have to consider people in their unmedicated state. Uh, and, and, and that's whether or not they're disabled. So that's a big issue. And the big issue that you see here is when people ask for an accommodation in the workplace. If they're not able to stand for extended periods of time, or if they're not able to lift heavy objects, or if they need breaks and things like this, they will ask for an accommodation. And what the law requires is that the employee and the employer engage in what's called an interactive process, where they make a request for an accommodation, and you evaluate whether or not that's reasonable. If it's not, you are supposed to propose something back, and it's this give and take until you hopefully reach a decision of some sort of accommodation that will let them uh, perform their job. So if you see that, uh, be aware that it's an important issue. It is not to be dismissed out of hand. Do not just tell people, no, we're not going to do that. That's an unreasonable accommodation. Or no, that, that, you know, that type of vest you're requesting, uh, it costs too much money. You know, don't, don't just say that. Uh, that might be the case, but have an interactive dialogue and see if there's some alternative that you can agree upon. The Equal Pay Act, that is um, basically the law that, that says you can't pay men and women differently for their same job. The Fair Labor Standards Act, that is a very, very important issue and I think something we're going to talk about toward the end. It is one of the fastest growing claims in employment litigation. This is the minimum wage and overtime law. And basically anyone who works more than 40 hours a week has to be paid time and a half. Uh, however, county governments can opt instead of paying time and a half to give employees what's called compensatory time off. And that means you're going to give them, uh, for every hour of overtime that they work, you're going to give them one and a half hours of paid time off. And they can bank that into their system. So that way, if you have people working overtime, you're not having the, the financial liability right then of, of paying it. Of course, you're, you're accruing that liability to pay later on in the form of compensatory time off, but that's what it's designed for. Question down front. Uh, Kent, the salary issue, uh, if you have somebody that, my name's Randy Ogino, Fett Kenny. Randy. If you got somebody on salary, yeah. the hour, how to, you know, I've heard that, you know, if they do work a lot of extra hours or something, sometimes they can file charges saying, well, I should have been paid some overtime. That's right. Um, the, the important thing to understand is that just paying someone a salary does not make them exempt from overtime. Okay? Let me say that again. Just paying someone a salary does not exempt them from overtime. In order to be exempt from overtime, someone has, there's, there's, there's basically a two-prong test. One, you have to pay them a salary. So that's part one. But two, they have to work the type of duties that by statute qualify them for an exemption. And those duties are, there, there's a whole list of the type of exemptions, but it's typically someone has to be a manager, which means that they have to spend 51% or more of their time supervising the work of other people. And then they have to have the authority to hire and fire other people. If someone has those type of responsibilities and they're paid a salary, then you can classify them as exempt and you don't have to worry about paying them overtime. But if they don't have authority to hire or fire, or if they don't spend more than half their time managing two other people, then it doesn't matter that you pay them a salary. You still have to pay them overtime. And the way you, you then have to pay them overtime is you, you, you use their salary to calculate what an equivalent hourly rate would be. And then when they go over 40 hours a week, you have to pay them time and a half for those hours over 40. All right, this is, we're going to get a lot of questions here. I know it. I'm from Henry County. I'm the chair of LEC. Uh, the question I have, it, it, it kind of goes back to the uh, another at-will exception, but it's also about pay and also about personnel. 
the thing I like was the distinguished speaker before you, or maybe two yes. before you, he indicated that uh, he said that you have to trust staff, and if you don't trust staff, uh, they should not be there. Now, my question to you is, in my county, we are the another at-will exception. We have a civil service, so at cause. Now, how can we legally uh, uh, remove a staff member that we don't trust? How can we legally do that and, use, and not violate uh, what you're teaching us? Sure. You, all you have to do is create a good paper trail as to why you don't trust them, and then you have to be able to make the argument that that lack of trust constitutes cause under your civil service system. So your civil service system will say employees can only be terminated for cause. Cause means this. Boop, 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 boop. It'll define it. And what you uh, and your county attorney have to do is say, all right, how do we fit lack of trust into that definition of cause? And, and if you can do it, then go, go do it. And, and, uh, and that, that's, that's about as simple as that. We've got one here and then one there. So I don't know who is first. We'll start here. Uh, Van Baker, Lamar County. You led me right into my question. Okay. Uh, I worked for a large corporation. Uh, HR was constantly on, on us to document performance or any issues like trust yeah. uh, in the personnel file. What we were constantly fighting, usually with the EEOC, was whether the employee had the right to see their personnel file. I, is it any different with, 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 we took the position that that was our file, and uh, if we wanted to show it to them, we could. If we didn't want to show it to them, we didn't have to. Yeah, you can probably get away with that in the private employment context, but their personnel file is an open record. And so they are going to be entitled to, to, to view that. I think you can make them make an open records request, but uh, unless it falls within an exception of the open records law, such as an open investigation or something, they're going to have a right to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, yes. All right, one more, and then I think we should, should move on to, uh, just to kind of keep things going. Yes, uh, Harisha Thomas, Jeff Davis County. I have a question. Okay. What if a person were at 60 hours, I'm going back to the overtime. Okay. Six hours straight, um, but there's no overtime based in that. And the way that the company that they work for justifies it is because it's not in the same pay period, pay week. Mm -hmm. Is that legal? Well, okay, let me make sure I'm understanding. So, uh, let me explain it this way. Overtime is not based on working more than a certain number of hours a day. So it's not based on working more than eight hours a day. It is based on working more than 40 hours in a week. Uh, so someone can work 12 hours in a day, not be owed any overtime, unless later in the week they go over 40 hours. Then what you have to do in your county policies is define what constitutes the work week. So most people would say it's Sunday to Saturday, but that's not always the case. And then you have, that's the time period, whatever your policy says, that's the time period that you have to look for that 40 hour threshold. Okay, what I'm saying, because we work the Friday and Saturday, uh, 12 hours. Okay. And then we work Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Well, 24 and then 36 gives you 60. But they are saying that the work week starts over that Sunday. Yeah, it, it, if, if your policy says that, if your policies say that the work week is defined as Sunday through Saturday, then if they work Friday and Saturday, then those hours are for that week, and then Sunday, they start over. And then if they work Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, then fine, but they don't get to, they don't get to lump those days together to get overtime if it's, unless it fits within the work week. But it's important, that, and that's why this is very important for you to define your work week in your policies. And work weeks can be defined differently for firefighters and, and police officers or other county employees, but you, you need to define what it is so you don't run into that situation where employees want to selectively lump which days are most beneficial to them together. So, so choose a day, put it in writing, and, and follow it. 
Um, all right, the last thing I'll mention on this slide, the Family and Medical Leave Act. This is something, you, uh, a big issue. It's complicated and technical. You should be aware of it. It provides employees with the right to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave for a serious medical condition of their own, for the serious medical condition of a family member that they have to care for, or for the birth of a child. Um, there's also new provisions that have been added that provide up to 26 weeks of leave for service uh, member issues, such as if a family member is deployed to active duty and they need some time off to, to handle those issues, or if a family member is injured while in service and they need time off to care for that uh, service member who's now come home, they're allowed time off under the statute for those reasons as well. But it, what's important to understand is that when employees come and they're complaining about medical issues and needing time off, little bells should go off in your head that, hmm, is this an FMLA, possibly an FMLA issue? If so, you need to send the employee notice that says, this might be an FMLA issue. If you want to apply for FMLA leave, please complete this paperwork. And then it's on them to turn it in. But it's important that you take that step. Um, Immigration Reform and Control Act, I'll say this one thing, uh, counties, lo public, local governments have to use E-Verify these days to uh, verify the employment eligibility of their employees. Your E-Verify number has to be posted on your county website or if it's not on your website, if you don't have a website, you have to send it into the Carl Vinson Institute for it to post on its website. Um, all public works contracts have to uh, use contractors that also use E-Verify and at the end of the year, which is what I'm actually working with a lot of our county and city clients on now, as you have to submit a report at the end of the year that lists all the public works contracts you went into that year and certifying that all of them are E-Verify users. Also, if your county uh, or administers public benefits, such as employee benefits, all recipients of those benefits have to sign an affidavit verifying that they're lawfully present in the United States. And at the end of the year, there's another report that has to be filed where you certify that uh, what public benefits your county provides and that you do not have any unverified illegal alien recipients of those public benefits. So uh, your folks should be taking care of those reporting issues, but there, there was a long list. This was, last year was the first year that the reporting went into effect. There was a long list of counties and cities that did not comply last year. I don't think any of them got punished, um, probably because the, the state's being lenient on the first year, but they might not be so lenient in the following years. So um, have their end of the year reporting issues on your mind. Um, other state laws, there's a Georgia Whistleblower Act that prohibits discriminating or retaliating against employees for complaining or reporting about corruption or waste and abuse in government. Georgia First Offender Statute, that you cannot discriminate against an employee because of a uh, criminal conviction that has been expunged under the Georgia First, Defendant statute, First Offender Statute. And there's all sorts of common law claims that, that uh, employers can be subject to. Um, if you have a supervisor who sexually harasses an employee, that employee can file a Title VII complaint for sexual harassment, but they can also file a state law claim for negligent hiring or supervision, where if that supervisor did something like this in the past and you kept them around and didn't do anything about it and then they did it again, that's another type of claim for negligent hiring, negligent retention, defamation. You fire an employee for uh, suspected theft or something, and then they, their, their next employer calls for a job reference, and you say, oh yeah, we fired them, he stole, he stole money out of county funds. Well, you've just accused that person of a crime, and you better hope that you can prove it to a legal certainty, otherwise you're going to have a, a difficult time defending a defamation claim. <laughs> Invasion of privacy, this comes up a lot of times when we're searching employees' email records. Um, even when they're a county email account, it's very important that your policies make clear that the county owns the email account and owns the records and that they should have no expectation of privacy. So when they're emailing love letters to and from their, their uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, that they need to know that's subject to search. And um, it might end up in Dave Cole's office one day sitting, he's reviewing emails, and they might not have ever expected that that would happen. Um, all right. Special issues that affect government employers. I want to cover some of this. 
Um, these are all, all the things I've just talked about are things that are universally applicable to private and public employers. But since you're a public employer, it means you're also subject to constitutional restrictions. This is freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, equal protection, due process. A lot of people don't understand, people don't have free speech rights in the private market. They, you know, if, uh, a private company, XYZ Corp, can, can fire an employee for, for speech they make. They don't have free speech rights. The, the Constitution only limits government action. But since you're a government employer, it limits you. So you cannot terminate people for reasons that would violate their constitutional rights. So that's a unique issue that affects governmental uh, employers. So what are some of these issues? First Amendment. Um, this includes freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to complain about grievances, freedom to petition government. Um, and basically the standard is whether or not the employee is speaking pursuant to his job duties as an employee or if he's speaking as a citizen on what's called a matter of quote unquote public concern, okay? If he's speaking as an employee pursuant to his job duties, it's not gonna be protected speech and you can take action against the employee for that. For example, there was a case recently in the Supreme Court where uh, a person in the district attorney's office made reports about, or accusations I should say, about um, people lying on, on applications to get arrest warrants. Well, they said the issue was, is that protected speech under the First Amendment? The answer was no, because he was speaking as an employee, reporting those issues as part of his job duties, okay? But if the employee were to go home and be out on the, on the street petitioning, you know, picketing and petitioning government for whatever reason, then he's speaking as a citizen as a matter of public concern, and that is free speech. And you cannot just go and fire the employee for those reasons. So that's always the test. And then if it is protected speech, the courts basically employ a balancing test. They say, well, they, okay, the employee has free speech rights, but on the other hand, the county has a right to, uh, to efficient operation of its government, to manage its workplace. So they, they, they balance who they think has the stronger interest. And so it's one of those things where there's never a bright line 100% rule because you're trying to predict how a court or a jury would, would, would balance the interests. But, that, but that's the basic standard. This is coming out a lot nowadays with employees posting on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, is the question is, when they're out there making statements about the county or their supervisors um, and it's upsetting you, can you terminate them? And, and there's, there is never an absolute answer I can, I can give. I can't just say yes and I can't just say no. It, it depends. Um, but, but I think that, that's the, the, the takeaway you need to go away with is that it's, it is not just something you can walk, away, walk into without your eyes wide open and, and making a thoughtful decision about it. Uh, but but that's, that's the area of risk. Invasion of privacy. Uh, this is when you're searching employees uh, you know, personal belongings, their desks, their email accounts. This case, City of Ontario versus Quan, recent Supreme Court case where a fire department was searching um, uh, the cell phones of fire department employees for text messages because they had gone over their, their allotted limit and were causing the, the city overages. So they searched the text messages and found a whole bunch of stuff in there that shouldn't have been said. And the employees claimed invasion of privacy. Um, and the court said no, no invasion of privacy um, because there was policies in place that said these are subject to search, this is a county cell phone, uh, and, and everything on it belongs to the county, and the search was reasonable because they didn't just go and download everything on the cell phone, they really narrowed it down to just the text messages, they limited it to the text messages, for the time period where the overage occurred. So it was a very narrow search and the court held that, that was reasonable. But again, this is one of those areas where there's no bright line answer because the, the, the invasion of privacy standard is whether or not the search is reasonable. Well, what is reasonable? It depends on the circumstances of every case. But, but be aware of that. Due process rights. Um, 
Public employees can have a protected property right in their employment, which means you cannot just fire them without notice and an opportunity to be heard. All right? These property rights can come from statutes, regulations, promises, ordinances, uh, or your civil service system. And if an em uh, employee has a due process right, uh, you cannot terminate them without providing them with due process. Now, one of the questions that always comes up is the question about uh, resignations. If we can just get the employee to resign, we're, not, we're gonna be in the clear, right? Well, not so fast. If that person is being forced to resign, or if they feel compelled to resign, that's gonna be what's called a constructive discharge. So if, if they are re essentially resigning in lieu of termination, that, that, is, that is effectively, in the eyes of the law, a termination, and it will be treated that way. So be aware of that. Don't think that, that you can avoid these requirements by kind of forcing someone into resignation. If a person has a property right in their employment, there's a, the, the due process rights are as follows. Number one, you need to give them advance notice of the termination. This is often called a, a pre-discipline or a pre-termination hearing. It doesn't have to be big and fancy. The word hearing doesn't mean what you think it means. It means basically that, uh, that the, the supervisor should give the employee a letter that says, uh, I think you've done X, Y, and Z, and I'm planning to terminate your employment. I have scheduled a meeting with you in my office at, at 9 a.m. on Monday morning where I welcome you to respond to these charges, and I'll consider anything you have to say. And then the employee shows up in the office that morning, and uh, the employer says, well, I think you did this. And the employee says, all right, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. And all the supervisor has to say is, okay, thank you very much. You're fired. That's all you have to do. I mean, I don't mean to, to be uh, you know, coy with that, but it's just, it's, that's all it has to be, just an advance notice and an opportunity to respond. And maybe the employee will give you information that makes you change your opinion, but it doesn't have to be that way. So make sure you, um, you give the employee that advance notice. And then afterwards, and this is particularly true in your civil service system, they have a due process right to a post-termination hearing. And in order for that hearing to comply with due process, you need to give them notice of the charges, the names of the witnesses that are going to be used against them. Uh, you have to hold the hearing within a reasonable period, no, no dragging it out for years and years. You have to give the employee the opportunity to be heard. They have to be able to confront any witnesses or evidence you present against them. Uh, it needs to be before an impartial decision maker, and that can be... Uh, you know, some counties don't have a civil service system, but they have sort of an appeal procedure built in where employees can appeal to the county manager. That's fine, as long as the county manager isn't the person who fired them in the first place. You know, they, they cannot, you can't make them appeal to the same decision maker. So you need to have them appeal to an independent person or panel, and they have to have the right to a lawyer. If they want a lawyer, let them. Don't tell them no. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times you can see the writing on the wall that certain employees are going to file claims. These, these pre- uh, or post-termination hearings are very helpful in defending litigation, very helpful. And so uh, I, w I use them, I get a court reporter, and you s swear the person under oath, and you get a transcript of their testimony. And, and you are miles ahead of the game if you can do that. So it's, it is not a bad thing, and it's very effective. Um, and in addition, now you've got an additional layer of review that will hopefully affirm the termination decision. So when now in litigation, they not only have to prove that the supervisor who fired them discriminated against them, but that also the decision maker on the appeal, whether it's the county manager or the, or the board of commissioners or a civil service board, that they also discriminated against them. It, it creates another hurdle that's actually very helpful. If you make a mistake, you can always go back and fix it. Procedural violations can always be cured. Um, one other thing that's interesting, if an employee is terminated for some st stigmatizing reason, such as you accuse them of theft or a crime or you know, some fraud, something like that, that, that uh, is, is a stigmatizing issue and they have a right to what's called a name clearing hearing where they get to come in and say, I didn't do it, here's all my evidence that says I didn't do it, 
There has to be a public hearing where they can clear their good name, and that's it. You don't have to, you know, they, they're fired at that point. You don't have to prove your case. You can respond if you want, but you just have to give the employee an opportunity to refute the allegations and clear their name. All right, a little bit of time left. I want to cover, this is the area I wanted to cover about how these cases play out in litigation. And I've, I've kind of boiled down what is a, a lot of information into four bullet points. If you think about it, the way these cases play out in litigation is there is rarely, if ever, what we call direct evidence of discrimination. People know enough nowadays that they know when they're going to fire an employee, they don't come out and say, I think you're too old for the job, Steve. We're just going to have to let you go. Or, I don't want women on my staff. You know? People don't say that. Uh, I mean, well, they do, but it's rare. Um, usually, if discrimination occurs, that's what the person's thinking, but they know enough to say, to, or they know enough to know, I can't say that. So instead they say, I think Steve's too old, but I can't come right out and say that, so I'm go I noticed that he missed uh, three days last month of work. That violated our, our attendance policy. I'm going to fire him for attendance violations. He can't refute that. That's how it goes. Well, the way these cases play out in litigation is it becomes the employee's burden to prove that attendance was not really the reason you fired him and that you're merely saying that as a pretext to cover up for age discrimination. But in, since you never came out and said, I'm firing you because you're too old, there's no direct evidence of that. So what do they have to do? They have to prove that you had discriminatory intent through what's called circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that doesn't directly prove the fact in question, but that creates some sort of inference that that was likely the case. So if someone's making a race discrimination claim, uh, the supervisor is not going to say, I'm firing you because of your race or because of your, cause, cause you're African American or whatever the case might be. But what the employee will say is, yeah, they didn't say that when they fired me, but over the past two years, I've heard them say these racial slurs. Or, or over the past years, they've treated the, me and these other African-American employees differently in these ways. And that creates an inference that when they fired me, that was really the reason why they acted. So what are the big pieces of circumstantial evidence that employees use? Number one, the number one reason is inconsistent treatment of similarly situated employees. All right, what that means is if you're going to fire Steve for absenteeism for missing three days last week, you need to look at who else missed three days last week or who else missed three days in the last year and what did you do in those situations. If you let somebody off the hook with a verbal warning, for missing five days two months earlier and now you're going to fire Steve for missing three, you better have a pretty darn good explanation as to why you're treating him so much harder than you did the other person. Because if you don't have that explanation, Steve is going to point to that other guy and say, this really wasn't about attendance. If it was, he would have fired the guy who had twice as many absences as I did. Instead, he really wanted to fire me because of my age, jumped on the opportunity to call it attendance, and that's what we're dealing with. So when you're, gonna, when you're dealing with an employee who is losing their job, it is critical that you look at past situations of similarly situated employees and how you have responded. The next thing you have to look at is did you follow your own policies? It drives me nuts, but so many county employee handbooks have this policy in there called progressive discipline. Uh, it sounds great, but it's, it's a lawyer's nightmare. Because inevitably, the policy says, first employees are going to get a written warning. No, I'm sorry. First employees are going to get a verbal warning. Then they're going to get a written warning. Then they'll get a final written warning. Then they'll be suspended. And then after we exhaust all these things, only then will we resort to termination. Termination is considered a last resort. 
well, that's true, that's great in an ideal workplace, but let's just imagine that tomorrow, the employee walks in with a baseball bat and smashes his computer to pieces. Well, are you supposed to give him a verbal warning? <laughs> No, you're going you're gonna to fire the person. But inevitably, you're going to get uh, charged, filed, you're going to be in a deposition, and the, the lawyer representing that person is going to say, this, this is the county employee handbook, isn't it? Yes, it is. This is, a, this is a, a, states the policies of the county, the official policies of the county. Oh, yes. And these are important to follow in all cases to give the employees fair notice of what's expected of them. Yes, yes, yes. Will you please turn to page 132 of this handbook? And it lays out the progressive discipline. Now, when Susan came in and bashed her computer in, she had never received a verbal warning, had she? Nope. She never received a written warning, did she? She was never, you just went straight to the throat and you t fired her. You didn't follow your own policy, did you? The truth is, you didn't want to follow all those things because you thought Sally was too old and you just wanted to fire her. You found a reason you did it. Isn't that right? Yeah, that, that's what it's going to be. And we all know it's, you know, a bunch of stuff. Um, but that's the game they play. And it does look really bad if you didn't follow your own policies. So the question is, uh, did you follow the policies? If you have one of those progressive disciplinary policies, revise it. Revise it to say... This is a list of possible disciplinary actions we can take, but we do not guarantee that one of these is going to precede the other. We reserve the right to decide which sort of discipline will be imposed. Um, so be aware of that. The next issue to be aware of, bad behavior by supervisors. This is the most, I, th I think, a surprising issue to people. Um, when these cases are, are being investigated or tried before a jury, it is not about the employee. We always want to make it about, well, the employee did this and this and their file has these warnings and they're this terrible person. We have the right to fire. It's never about that. It's always about us, not the lawyers, but it's about the employer. It's about the supervisor and whether or not that person is perceived as likable and fair. That's, that's what it comes down to. And do they trust you? And do they believe you? Because you're being accused of being prejudiced and discriminating against someone for some protected reason, and you need to, I'm saying you, I'm not, I'm not meaning you individually, but the supervisor or the county, and, and, and you're in a position where you have to defend that that's not true. So to a lot of people's surprise, the trial becomes much more about the supervisor than anything else. And what, what kills cases is when the supervisor is a real jerk, or is engaged in bad behavior, or has forwarded dirty jokes by emails or as you know playing good old boys with the friends and and and, and not being you know, equal to the women or whatever the case might be that is the real risk factor that, that, that you have to consider and be aware of because that is that is something that kills cases just as bad as not following policies just as bad as, as inconsistent treatment all right the last thing I'll mention is lack of documentation or poor documentation um, One of the questions that should always be asked when someone is going to be fired is, is this going to be a surprise? If it's going to be a surprise to the employee, you're probably not in a good position to fire them. That, that's the bottom line. If you've done things right, the employee should be well aware that they're on thin ice and that when you fire them, it shouldn't be a surprise. And the way you get there to make sure it's not a surprise is to have good, thorough documentation. That means when an employee is met with to give a, a verbal counseling, don't just leave it as a verbal. Have this, train your supervisors to write a memo to the file. Today I met with John. We discussed the fact that he did X, Y, and Z, and that this, you know, the, the expectations going forward are this. I'm going to review his performance in 90 days, and we'll see how he's doing. Put that in the file because two years from now, you will not remember that meeting or what was discussed and you need to create a record that it happened. That doesn't mean you're giving the employee a, a written warning. It means you're creating documentation to remember that the verbal discussion was held. Performance reviews are another area that are very, uh, very harmful. Uh, favorable performance reviews lose cases every time. 
And it's something about human nature. It's very difficult to be very critical of people in writing. So there's a tendency of supervisors to sugarcoat performance reviews and say, well, I normally just circle the five and give everyone above expectations or exceeds expectations in every area. But this person was pretty bad, so I didn't give him a five. I gave him a three. Well, you know what a three is? Three is satisfactory. So and the only thing that matters is the total score on their review. And so the employee will ultimately get fired for, for doing a bad job, and they'll say, all of my performance reviews were satisfactory. How am I supposed to know I wasn't doing my job if you rated me satisfactory? And you can explain, well, I mean, really doing your job, I would normally rate them a five, exceeds expectations, but so satisfactory. That was really pretty bad. That, that might be true in your case, but that's not the way it's going to play out. So you need to, uh, people need to be honest and accurate about evaluations. And also be aware these revaluations have uh, different categories of information. They're usually ranked on you know, attendance, timeliness, personal appearance, job performance, all these criteria, and they're all weighted equally. So someone might get a, a zero or a one in job performance, but they got a five in, in, in professional appearance, and they got a five in attendance, so their total score comes out to be three and a half or four. Well, that, that's all that matters. So be aware the only, really, the only thing that matters is the total score. And if, if you're trying to build documentation to, to demonstrate that an employee is not doing their job, you need to have thorough and accurate documentation of that. Um, the bottom line is just that every termination is going to have an element of risk to it. Every, every single one. Um, it'll always have two sides of the story. Do not focus only on your perspective. Do not focus only on proving what a bad person that is, but you need to take a look at yourself and ask, how have we responded to prior situations in the past? Have we followed our own policies? Have we created a good documentation trail? Um, and what are, be able to explain clearly exactly what the reasons for your termination are. All right, we've got five minutes left, and I am going to want just to address some recent trends in employment law. Rise of retaliation claims, FLSA litigation, social media, and ADA. I can't cover all that in five minutes, but I'll try. Um, retaliation charges. We talked about this as the number one type of charge there is nowadays. Look at how it's grown over the last five, six years. You can see the steady increase in number of retaliation EEOC charges. Up, upwards of 100,000 now. Uh, as a percentage of charges, you can see the numbers going up. Uh, I talked about reasons earlier why this is the case. I said it's human nature, I think, to retaliate against people, and that's true. Uh, but some legal reasons are the courts have gradually expanded the scope of what is constitute, constitutes protected activity. So in the past, not every complaint someone made was going to be protected by statute. Over the years, courts have gradually expanded and expanded what constitutes protected activity. So now if someone is merely complaining about a friend or a coworker, uh, they don't even have to prove that what they're complaining about was actually true. As long as they have a reasonable belief that discrimination occurred, that's going to be protected activity. Also, broader definition of adverse action. I talked about giving people the cold shoulder not inviting them to the pizza party or to the birthday cake party down you know, the kitchen. Ordinarily, in a traditional discrimination claim, that is not going to constitute an adverse action. But in the context of retaliation, it will. More things constitute retaliation than they do discrimination. And also, just the truth of the matter, that the, the media and movies, we've hyped up and we, we, we make heroes out of our whistleblowers with, with movies like... Uh, Aaron Brockovich, or you know, I don't know, whatever all these movies are, where, where we, we talk about people blow the whistle, and it's true. So when you're going into a case, that is what you're up against, is the automatic perception that this person blew the whistle, and you retaliated against them to silence the truth, particularly uh, in the government context. So, you know, you can see the types of retaliation people claim they suffered. Excluded from work activity, given the cold shoulder, verbally abused by managers, it's not all about firings. It's, it's these little things. FLSA claims. These are the overtime and minimum wage claims. These have been going up because it's a technical area that employers 
I think, innocently are getting wrong because they're, they're making incorrect decisions about who is exempt and who is not, who is entitled to overtime and who is not, and also how overtime needs to be calculated. It's a very complicated procedure. And, and, and employees, if, if you've ever watched daytime TV and you'll see the lawyers that advertise on TV during the day, it's always about, a lot of times, uh, it's either car accidents or it's going to be FLSA claims. And I know plaintiff's lawyers who, when they have clients come in for a consultation about a discrimination claim, they automatically ask them about how they're paid and how they're paid overtime, even if that's not what the person is there for initially, because they say, you know, five times out of ten, they'll discover an FLSA claim. And if you get an FLSA claim, it doesn't matter what your intent was. You see, in all the discrimination claims we've been talking about, their job is to prove that you intended to discriminate against them. FLSA intent doesn't matter. You either paid them overtime or you didn't, whether you did it innocently or intentionally. It doesn't matter. And they automatically get their attorney's fees, and they automatically get double the amount of damages as liquidated damages to punish the employer for not doing it right. So it's, it's a very uh, low risk, high reward case for plaintiff's lawyers to take. You can see the it's explosion of litigation over the past uh, you know, 10 years or so. Um, this might be a little small, you can probably see it better on your, your printouts, but, but basically the, the, big, the big issues in overtime litigation are not properly classifying someone as exempt. Having them work off the clock is a big deal. If an employee works off the clock, um, you need to understand that employee needs to be paid for the time they worked, but you then have to discipline them for violating your policy of working unauthorized time. Okay, so you cannot just say, well, you chose to work from home or you chose to stay late, you weren't supposed to do that, that was, that's on you, you don't get paid. No, you have to pay them, but it becomes a disciplinary issue. So that's a big issue. Um, and just the last couple things I'm just going to mention, we've talked about it through. Social media is an, an uh, evolving issue. It comes up with Facebook posts and, and tweets about First Amendment protections. It comes up when you're searching people's devices, especially when they're bringing their own um, iPhones and Androids and Windows phones to work. That's what people are bringing their own devices to work and connecting it up to the, to the counties or, or, or uh, employers system. And so it's, it's raising all these thorny issues about protected uh, speech and privacy rights. So be aware of that. And we talked about the fact that the ADA amended recently to broaden the scope of who's protected. So I kind of blew through those. I'm happy to stay around and answer any more questions you might have. I hope this gave you some, some help or perspective on the issues you might encounter. And I wish you uh, the best of luck and enjoy the rest of your seminar.